so good morning to you. Nice to see you out. Bit of a damp one, so well done for braving the elements and coming to church. It's good to gather together. And today we're going to be celebrating Holy Communion together. So we'll be sharing the Eucharist and we'll also be continuing our series on the not so minor prophets. So all that to come. But as we begin, can we stand together, please? And let's call each other to worship using the words on the screen. As usual, you speak out the words in gold. Brothers and sisters, let us draw closer to the cross of Christ. As we come together to worship, let us abandon our own selfish interests. For Jesus did not exploit his divine nature, but emptied himself of all privilege and became human. He was obedient to the point of death. So let's ask the Holy Spirit to lead us as we worship. Lord, Lord, be our leader and our guide. Help us to crucify our selfish interests and renew our love for you and each other. Amen. Our opening song, just as a call really that we focus on God, that we look to him. (coughs) So let's use this as a prayer as we enter into our time of worship. Let's look to him. Look to our Lord. to you I won't be overwhelmed give me vision to see things like you do God I look to you you're where my help comes from give me wisdom you know just what to do God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom. Know just what to do, and I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock forever, all my days. I will love you, God. Alleluia, our God reigns. Alleluia, our God reigns. Alleluia, our God reigns forever. 
Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's take some time to move among each other and just to share peace with each other. If you're visiting, just shake someone's hand and say, the peace of the Lord be with you. All right, folks, we'll begin to mosey back to our seats. So we're going to be sharing Holy Communion later, and uh, it's important that we we don't just do that superficially or just rush into it. So we take some time always just to prepare our hearts, to say sorry to God, to repent, but also to receive his forgiveness. So we're going to use the words on the screen to do that. Let's take some time to do just that. Lord God, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So may God who loved the world so much that he sent his son to be our savior. May he forgive us our sins. May he make us holy to serve him in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue in worship. We're going to sing a, a song that has actions. I believe the, the Hunt ladies are on actions today. And uh, after this song, kids, it's time for you to go out to your groups. So uh, if you're primary age children, after this song, you'll be going out this door. And if you're crash age children, out this door to your times together. But let's all stand. And let's sing, and uh, if you're able, join in the actions. Cause my God's the king of the, the giants, and my God's the king of the, the lions, and my God's the king of the creatures of the deep, and my God's the king of me. Heard the story about my friend King Dave. I wouldn't let the giant stand in his way. He said, Hand me my sling, cause I'm not that tall. Cause my God is bigger and I'll watch him fall. And my God's the king of the, the giants. And my God's the king of the, the lions. And my God's the king of the creatures of the deep. And my God's the king of me. Have you heard the one about the guy? called Dan Yes, he was a mighty holy praying man He said, throw him to the den of the scary beast But God saved a hero from the lion's team My God's the king of the giants My God's the king of the lions My God's the king of the creatures of the deep My God's the king of me
Cause this is more than history He will do the same for me A Jonah and the will at sea When I'm lost and afraid all alone In the dark you will win me Oh, you will win me and My God's the king of the giants and My God's the king of the lions and My God's the king of the creatures of the deep and My God's the king of me Cause my God's the king of the Stuff. Let's remain standing, children, out to your groups now. So, um, crash and Sunday school, pre-primary, primary. <coughs> Go and have lots of fun. And as they head out, we're going to continue in worship. Let's uh, sing out together. <laughs> It's your breath in our lungs, 
So oh God, thank you that every good thing that we have comes from you. Lord God, thank you that everything we are is because of you. You sustain us. You give us life. Lord, in Jesus, you give us eternal life. Lord, help our hearts to be full of praise this morning. And as we turn now to your holy word, and as we think of you particularly as our refuge and strength, Holy Spirit, I want to pray for those uh, among us who are just going through it at the moment, that you would encourage them, that you'd lift their hearts. But for all of us, would you remind us of who you are, your greatness, and you're on our side. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let's sit as we continue our way through the Minor Prophets today. We're in Nahum, good old Nahum. And we're going to read from chapter 1 of Nahum's prophecy, beginning at verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so as we continue uh, through the 12 not-so-minor prophets and turn our attention to Nahum. There he is, a representation of him. We're going to, as usual, watch the short video from the Bible Project to get an overview of the book, and then I'll... uh, focus our attention on one of the key themes of Nahum. So watch the screen, and uh, our friends from the Bible Project are up there as usual. The Book of the Prophet Nahum. This short prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before, and so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so, chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But, this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. 
And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age, how he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history, and Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the Battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. It's an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter 1, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time, he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place. And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. All righty. Who likes a sequel, a film sequel? Any fans of sequels? Depends, you know, some of them are brilliant, some of them are oh, terrible. But uh, Hollywood loves sequels because there's spondoolies in it, isn't there? There's 16 Batman films, did you know that? There's 27 James Bond films. And the Marvel Universe has 32 films and counting. So Hollywood loves a sequel. Now, there's something appealing about sequels because you get to see at the end of one movie and you're dying to know how the story progresses. And if you're like me, you imagine all the different ways in which the story could progress. But there's something brilliant about a sequel because you can see how the character in the story goes on. And with that in mind, Nahum could be renamed Jonah the sequel. Jonah the sequel. Many of you were here last week, weren't you? And uh, Wesley unpacked the story of the prophet Jonah. Jonah, you'll remember, was called to go and preach to the same crowd to the wicked city of Nineveh. 
And Jonah really doesn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites because he hates them. He wants nothing to do with them. He just wants them destroyed. And so, you know, he does his escape routine. And uh, as he tries to get away from God, a, a big fish gets him back on track by vomiting him back closer to the city. So uh, that didn't work very well. And eventually he gets the message and he submits and he goes and preaches to the Ninevites. Very simple little uh, sermon. He preaches basically that in 40 days, they're all going to be destroyed. I'm sure he loved giving that message. But God's message piques the collective conscience of the Ninevites. And remember the story, they repented of their sin. They had a change of heart, a change of, of lifestyle. And God shows mercy and decides not to destroy the city. So the book of Jonah ends with Nineveh seemingly back on track and following the ways of God. And Jonah absolutely livid. I love the way Jonah ends. It's like an open-ended frustration and uh, it doesn't tie up the loose ends, which I really like. But it's not the end of the story. Because fast forward 100 years and we learn that the Nineveh and the Assyrians have, if you like, repented of their repentance. They've fallen back into uh, their evil lifestyle and their lifestyle, without going into the details, was thoroughly evil in many, many regards. And God says, I've had enough. I've had enough with evil upon evil upon evil. I'm going to finally destroy the Assyrians. Look at verses 12 and 14 of chapter 1 of Nahum. This is what the Lord says. Although they, the Ninevites, have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed. They will pass away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. So categorically, through Nahum, you see that the Lord has decided judgment is coming. So you can summarize these two minor prophets like this. Jonah is the story of what happens when a people repent and turn back to God. And Nahum is the story of what happens when a people say, we don't want nothing to do with you. We want to continue in this way, ignoring you, being godless, doing what we want to do. And this is what happens. So let's turn our story or turn our attention to the story of Nahum. After what I've just told you, you might find it ironic to learn that the word Nahum, the name Nahum means comfort or uh, consolation. And if you think it through with me, it, it makes more sense because Nahum didn't deliver his message to the Assyrians. He delivered his message to the Jews, to the people of God. And these were the people who had been conquered by the Assyrians. These were the people who'd been on the receiving end of the evil of the Assyrians. They'd been mistreated. They'd been abused in countless different ways. They have family and friends who'd been killed by the Assyrians. And God says to these people, I know what's going on. I see it. I will make sure that justice is done. In the end, I will make everything right. The righteous will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. I want you to think with me about how that message sounds if you're an oppressed group if you're on the receiving end of evil. There's great comfort in such a message. It reminded me a wee bit about the book of Revelation, which was primarily written, not exclusively, it's written to us too, but it was primarily written to the Christians of that time who were under the cause of Roman persecution. And God says to them, thinks, look, I know that things don't look good right now, but I want you to know how things turn out. I want you to know that I'm going to make everything right, that the righteous will be rewarded and that the wicked will be punished. We live in such relative comfort and peace. I'm sure if you're watching the news headlines at the moment, you can't even begin to grasp 
the suffering of some people around the world in many different places. So we don't spend much time thinking about God as judge because we don't really need to. But for our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world who are daily persecuted for their faith, the knowledge that in the end, and maybe post-death, but in the end, God will make everything right, that the righteous will be rewarded, and that the wicked will be punished, is something that our brothers and sisters hold on to tightly. If you've visited persecuted church around the world, you know that they're waiting for the Lord to return, for justice to be done. So hold on to that thought as we dig a wee bit deeper, because I want to focus our thoughts this morning on that verse that I sort of read slowly in the reading, Nahum 1 verse 7. So right in the middle of this prophecy, which is all about the judgment of God on Assyria, we have this beautiful promise, just sort of punctures and echoes throughout the whole book. Let's read it together, the Lord. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Let's read it again, but taste it. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. In a nutshell, this is what the Bible teaches about suffering. And we're going to unpack that a wee bit more. God never promises an easy life for his followers. In fact, he told his disciples explicitly here in John 16, he says, in this world, on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. He makes it plain. Look, trouble is part of the package. But in these times of trouble, God promises to be with us to be our refuge and strength. And if we get hold of that truth, then it makes all the difference. Please note that to the people of God in Nahum's day and to our persecuted brothers and sisters throughout the ages, God doesn't say, I'm going to take away your suffering. I'm going to give you an easy life. It's going to be a wee bed of roses for you all. But he does say that in the inevitable suffering, I, God, am with you. It's important for us to hear this message because we too go through trials. We too have troubles. I know that some of you are going through stuff at the moment. And also, as you know, I'm convinced that as it gets closer and closer to the Lord's return, we're going to see more and more birth pains, which means that we're going to have potentially more and more trouble. So we need to know what the Bible teaches about trouble, about trials. We need to know that they're coming for us all, but that God is on our side. And God in those troubles is our refuge and strength. And the Bible shouts this message all through its pages. Here are three examples of the same message in different parts of the Bible. And I want you to read them out with me with conviction that you believe this. And even if you don't, read them as if you do, because we have trust that the Holy Spirit will just put it in us as we read them, okay? So first of all, Psalm 46, verse 1, God. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Here's Jeremiah 16, 19. Again, let's read it together. Lord. Lord, you are my strength and fortress, my refuge in the day of trouble. And then Isaiah 41, verse 10, so, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So can you see the message in all of those? Trouble, yes trouble, but I am with you. I am with you in the midst of it. One of the questions we ask a whole lot, and we're probably asking it a whole lot when we look at our news and when we encounter things in our personal lives, is the question why. You know, 
why does my mother have to suffer from that disease? Why does my best friend have to die young? Why have I lost my job? Why am I unemployed? I'm sure, like me, you've asked the question why a thousand times. There's much about suffering that we don't understand and we won't understand this side of eternity. But building on what we've been saying this morning, I think there are three things that we can glean from Nahum which can help us even as we wrestle with the why questions, even as we're facing trouble. So here they are. The first is to not be surprised when trouble comes, but to recognize that as the Bible makes clear, as Jesus makes clear, that there will be times of trouble. We live in a broken world. It's broken because we've rejected God and his ways. And we haven't been given a free pass because we're Christians out of that trouble, out of that suffering. In fact, if we talk to our persecuted brothers and sisters, they would say that sometimes when we become Christians, we can have more trouble and more suffering. Because of sin, the universe we live in is not operating the way God intended. And so sometimes us and those we love are caught up in pain and suffering and we all know that but sometimes we forget it so there will be times of trouble that's what the book of Nahum makes clear but but here's the second thing that we need to remember that in that trouble the Lord is good and he cares for those who trust in him we have a God who understands suffering that's what we're going to celebrate or recognize later on a God who suffered at our hands a God who knows what it is to suffer but who in his eternal love meets us in our times of trouble with his eternal resources and sometimes that will mean that he lift us supernaturally out of the trouble sometimes there's healing sometimes there's transformation of relationships Sometimes there's physical provision and a whole lot of other ways in which God supernaturally intervenes. So remember that and expect that and ask God for that. Don't shy away from that. But even when he doesn't answer in that way, he remains our good father who loves us. And if we turn to him, he really is our refuge and strength, even as we go through stuff. He's good and he cares for those who trust in him. So those are the first two then thirdly, Nahum also makes clear that the day is coming when God will make everything right. There is a day when the righteous will be rewarded and when evil will be punished. And there are many verses in Nahum that say this. Uh, Here's verse 3 of chapter 1. The Lord is slow to anger but great in power. Listen, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. So we may live in a world of trouble. We may look around and say, evil's flourishing there, evil's flourishing there, evil's flourishing there, evil's flourishing everywhere. But it's short term. Because there's going to come a day when the judge of all the universe is going to step in and he's going to act. And he's going to judge the wicked and wipe away every tear from those who have suffered at their hands. So please remember these truths, especially if you're facing life's troubles this morning. But I want us to go further before I finish. Because God gives us this comfort, not just for ourselves, but also for the good of those around us. Can you see that? Or is that too small? Can you read it? Read these words of Paul from 2 Corinthians. Praise be. Praise be to the God and Father. very clear, but I'm going to say a few words about it anyway. Um, As we are comforted by God, we in turn can help others with the comfort we've received. Isn't that a beautiful thing? And listen, you know yourself that more and more people are looking for comfort, they're looking for hope, they're looking for a refuge from what they're going through. Increasingly, people need a shelter in a time of storm. 
and you can be that person. In Christ's name, you can offer them that safe place. So who's going to be there for that colleague that you work with whose life's fallen apart in some way? Who's going to be there for the neighbor who um, is really struggling? What Paul says that as Christians, as we have received the comfort of God ourselves, so we should be there offering his comfort to those around us in his name. Why? Because the Lord is good. Because he's our refuge in times of trouble. Because he cares for us as we trust in him. And so therefore, because he comforts us, we can therefore bring that comfort to others around us as they experience troubles. Do you see the pattern? So let's be those who turn to God when we face trouble, who don't get shocked when trouble comes our way, but say, Lord, this really sucks, but the eternal resources of my God are near. You are my refuge and strength. And as we receive comfort and strength for him, from him, then let's offer that comfort and strength to those around us. Yes? Let's pray for his help to do that. Living a God, I pray that we would believe these, these words and these truths. Lord, that we wouldn't lose heart, but instead that we'd turn afresh to you, our true refuge and strength in days of trouble. And I pray, Lord, as we draw from your eternal resources, that we would be able to be those who comfort others in your name. Lord, help us to be that safe place in a storm for those that we mix with each day. Help us to be people of peace, people who bring hope. Lord, I particularly want to pray for those who are struggling at the moment that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on them and that you would help them to lift their eyes to you and to shelter in you in the storm. Lord, would you draw close and especially as these loved ones receive communion, Lord, would they just know that you're with them, that you died for them, that you love them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing of what God has given us in Jesus as we move into time of sharing communion together. So let's stand and we'll sing this song together. became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sinners. The ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, His body. 
body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. Love so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. The rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah. Lord of all, the Lord of all, the Lord of all. Amen. If you're able, let's remain standing. Is the Father with us? Don't seem so sure. Let's try it again. Is the Father with us? Yes. Is Christ among us? Yes. This is our God. We are His people. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and our delight to give you thanks and praise, great Father, living God, supreme over all the world, creator, provider, savior, and giver. From a wandering nomad, you created your family. For a burdened people, you raised up a leader. For a confused nation, you chose a king. For a rebellious crowd, you sent your prophets. In these last days, you have sent us your Son, your perfect image, bringing your kingdom, revealing your will, 
dying, rising, reigning, remaking your people for yourself. Through him you have poured out your Holy Spirit, filling us with light and life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. His body was broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks to you, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. His blood was shed for us. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we do as Christ your Son commanded. We remember his passion and death. We celebrate his resurrection and ascension. And we look for the coming of his kingdom. Amen. Do take your seats. And thanks, Ethan. So if you'd like to participate in communion this morning, then uh, you come up in, in a line and uh, I'll be facing you with some bread. And then when you've taken the bread, you can take a step to your right and Jean will offer you uh, some of the, the wine. If you would like gluten-free wafers instead of the bread, just let me know when you come to me and I can go and get those. And if you'd prefer a blessing instead of the uh, elements today, then just indicate by doing this. All right, so let's partake of the bread and the wine together. Let's thank God together for what he's done for us in Christ. Almighty God, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Just before we have our closing song, a few wee notices. Um, prayer club is on Tuesday at 8 o'clock. Uh, great to see you there in the rectory or on Zoom. Wednesday next door, communion at 10 o'clock. And Friday, tots together at 10. Next Sunday is our harvest services. So we particularly say thank you to God for all his goodness to us. And one of the ways in which we can say thank you is by giving back. And uh, this year we're going to be uh, encouraging you to support the East Belfast Baby Bank with some specific things that they're short on. So I'll send this out today on the church WhatsApp. So if you prefer a non-paper version, then the list of what is needed will be on the church family WhatsApp today. But uh, if you want a paper version, then they're just here. But if you could purchase, if you're able to, this week, one or two things from the list and bring them next week as part of our harvest offering, then uh, we'll collect them at the back of church and we'll get them over and get them out to people who need them. All right? So that's next Sunday. If you can buy things this week and bring them next week. Katrina, come and join me, would you? This is one of the East Belfast Baby Bank team members and uh, there's another little notice in connection to that. Hi, um, so we've been very lucky to receive a generous donation from a local business and we're going to use that money to replace the cardboard boxes that we have in the store unit with proper plastic ones. Um, this is sort of help prevent damp and just help our storeroom. Um, this is quite a realistic reflection of what we're dealing with every week. We're, we're really overwhelmed by donations and it's a bit of a juggling act, sorting the clothes and then preparing the seven or eight referrals that we get every week. So um, we basically, with the help of Billy and David, who are going to adjust the shelving for us, we're going to remove everything out of the storage unit and um, just do a big sort out, basically. 
Um, but it's going to be a case of all hands on deck. So if you were by any chance free on uh, the uh, yeah, Tuesday or Wednesday of that week, um, the half term week, we're keeping the hall open all day and evening and we'd be grateful for any help, just either to lift boxes or short clothes. And if you can talk a friend into coming, that would be amazing. But um, it's hopefully gonna make our life a lot easier and we'll just be a bit more efficient afterwards. Great stuff, Katrina, and thank you and the others who do such amazing work with the Baby Bank. Um, November 10 is our remembrance service. That's at 11 o'clock, so don't come at 10 or 11.30. Uh, November 10th, remembrance with organizations at 11. And then just put this date in your head. Um, on Saturday, November the 30th, we're going to be having our Christmas fair. So as the usual, we'll need all hands on deck both preparing things and coming along on the day and bringing others. So put that uh, date in your diary and then we'll have more notices in the days to come. Let's stand for a closing song and prayer. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For oh, my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine. I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. But I am not forsaken For by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need his power is displayed To this I hold my shepherd will defend me Through the deep this valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overcome the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said, that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore 
more to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me to this i hold my hope is only jesus all the glory evermore to him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not i but through christ in me Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's remain standing. So may God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give to you a contrite heart. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you by his wounds. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak to you words of pardon and peace. Amen. And may the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with us. Amen. Folks, there will be prayer in front of the pulpit here if you'd like prayer for anything. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you soon. God bless you. Nice to see you. Thanks, guys.